<laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. Let's, uh, let's settle down. <laughs> Calm. Relax. And let's bow in prayer. Our Father, thank you for bringing us uh, to this point of our study tonight and for bringing each one of us out with uh, open minds, hungry hearts, uh, good listening ears, not to what I have to say, but to what your Holy Spirit has to minister to our souls. And we thank you for this uh, parenthetical interlude that is going to give us much hope and uh, much confidence in your ability to accomplish your purpose and to fulfill your promise. And we pray that as we look at this chapter of Revelation tonight, that you will assist us in understanding. And for all those who are out there watching by video, and following along, that you will use these words to minister to their hearts also and draw them into a greater trust relationship with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to all of you who are watching by YouTube, because I keep getting emails every week from people who are, and so that's good. I've been emailing out the study guides that we had from the early part of the study to people who wanted to catch up, and so that's good. I'm glad that uh, these uh, things are able to be used for people around the world. Uh, chapter 7 of Revelation tonight, chapter 7. Now, um, chapter 7 is a parenthetical chapter where at the end of the six seals that have been opened and prior to the seventh seal being opened, uh, which will announce the trumpets in chapter 8, there's an interlude where we see a summary of some things that have been going on during this period of time that's covered by the six seals. So there's, there's going to be John saying, after this I'm going to see something, but what I'm going to see is kind of a summary of what's been going on in another aspect of the Great Tribulation that wasn't covered by the seals. Okay, so this is not chronological. Chapter 7 is actually what we call parenthetical. It's in parentheses that, oh, by the way, while that was all going on, this was happening too. That's basically what we're saying. So let's dive into it and see what it says and answer some uh, fundamental questions about some of the things that are going on in here. The first eight verses are the depiction of uh, probably one of the most misinterpreted aspects of biblical prophecy. Uh, it is something that it seems like uh, famous and infamous cult leaders have grabbed a hold of this and tried to somehow teach that they were the ones who were going to be organizing this 144,000. Well, let's read what it says and then we'll go back and talk about what some of the options have been. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. So I'll stop right there for a moment. So here we have depicted four powerful angels who are in, are in control of the natural weather patterns of the world. Can you imagine what it would be like to not have any wind on the earth or the sea for a period of time. No air movement whatsoever. Absolutely still. Now on a day like this, we would wish for that, <laughs> right? But absolutely no air movement. Uh, the first thing you begin to notice is how hot it gets. The second thing you notice is how stinky it gets. Nothing is moving. Wake up in the mornings, you can't see anything because the fog is so dense, because there's no air, no air movement to move the moisture around to keep the air circulating, so all the moisture condenses at the earth. You're stuck in fog all the time. You can't get rid of smells. You can't get rid of anything. There is absolutely no wind. The trees are not, there's no air movement through the trees. Anybody understand botany? 
You know how important air movement over the leaves of trees is for the, for the trees to be able to properly photosynthesize the carbon dioxide into oxygen. So now all of a sudden what's happening is the, the production of oxygen is diminished some degree. We don't know how long this is taking place, but all of a sudden there's this dead calm over the whole earth. Now, then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun. So out of where? <laughs> out of the east. With the seal of the living God. So in other words, the authority of the living God. That's what that means. The seal stands for the authority. So this angel comes with the authority of the living God. And he calls with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, let's stop for a second. This could be interpreted that these four angels are the same four that rode riders that rode the four horses out as the first four seal judgments. The problem with that is that the riders on those horses are never called angels. So these are four different angels, different beings than the depiction of the four horsemen, not the same thing. So we can't say that, that those four horsemen are sent out to do their duty and then all of a sudden they're told to stop doing their duty because that's what this is about. That's totally different application. These are four specific angels and we don't have an indication other than through the, the, the discerning spirit of good logic, we don't have an indication as to when these angels are told to withhold the wind. We are only told that they're to withhold the wind and withhold the judgment that they're bringing against the natural forces of the earth until the 144,000 are sealed. So now we have to debate when does this sealing take place? Is John looking back in this parentheses to back all the way to prior to the first seal even being opened and seeing that now before all of these seals even happened, God said, I'm going to seal 144,000 people of my own. Then the four horsemen and the other seal judgments can begin along with these four angels. Or have the six seals all been finished already? We're at the middle point of the tribulation and that's when the sealing of the 144,000 takes place. So that they're only sealed for the second half of the tribulation. I'll give you a clue. If you read the rest of the chapter, it indicates that it probably is the former of my explanations, not the latter. It's probably John looking, being given a glimpse of all the way back to the beginning of the tribulation that this sealing of the 144,000 takes place at the beginning. And the reason we say that is because we're given a glimpse in the, starting in the ninth verse of this chapter, we're given a glimpse of a great multitude of people who have been martyred, who have been killed, who have come out of the tribulation already and are in the presence of God. If none of this is happening until the middle of the tribulation, where did those people come from? Okay, so this is probably, like we say, a parenthesis that says, okay, while all of these six seals were going on, this was already happening since the beginning. So at the very beginning of the tribulation, the four angels who were responsible for, for natural uh, force catastrophes on the earth, wind and hail and, and terrible storms and holding back that wind against... Uh, the uh, trees and the sea and the earth and so on, they were told at the beginning, don't start that judgment on the earth until after I get my 144,000 sealed. Once they're sealed, then we proceed and we see what else takes place.
Any questions so far? So, so you're thinking that that this is happening like at the at the beginning, or I mean during the? I'm I'm su starting at the beginning of the. the I, I'm suggesting that the sealing of the hundred and forty-four thousand takes place at the beginning of the tribulation. So this whole deal, like it's a, this seems a little bit odd to me because. Um, you know, you were kind of implying that with the winds, holding the winds back. I mean, that's kind of destructive right there. And then, it, and then this other angel is saying, don't harm anything until we seal these. Well, if they're holding the winds, aren't they already causing harm? They, they are causing some harm, but not nearly as catastrophic as what it's going to be when you all of a sudden release 140 mile an hour winds on something. That's, that's going to cause a lot more damage. Okay, so you're thinking that this, this sealing is going, the, the sealing of these witnesses or whatever is going to go on. And then somewhere in the tribulation will come the releasing of the wind. Yeah, and, and in fact, I, I think that it's, it's a rather short time span that this takes place in, this sealing. This, this ceiling isn't a, well, I'll do 12,000 today, and I'll do 12,000 in three months, and I'll do 12,000 six months later. And so while I'm waiting for all that to get done, none of the wind is being released. No, we're talking about just a short period of time when the angels withhold, they're commanded to withhold that wind. While So God says, basically what God is saying is, you know what? It's going to look like there's peace on the earth. It looks like It's going to look like everything is calm. And I'm going to take 144,000 people and I'm going to seal them so that when all the judgment starts, they're not affected. So ideally then, what we're thinking is that the tribulation will begin, the 144 will be sealed, and then sometime, could be early in the tribulation then or, or later, we don't really know, but that those winds will be released. Right. Yeah, and we're, you know, we're not told when those winds are released except that the winds play a play a factor. Uh, they they must play a factor in what happens in the seven seal judgments, when there's going to be great famine on the on the earth, and there's going to be great destructive forces on the earth. And you would think that the winds are there's got to be winds being released at that time. So, like I say, I I think it's just John is given a vision. He's given the vision after he's given the vision of the six seals, and then he says after this. I saw these four angels. That is not a chronological statement that those four angels, he, they don't do their job until after the six seals are released. He's saying after this, I'm given additional information. And that additional information is this. While or at near the beginning of the tribulation, this was all also taking place because while God was bringing judgment on all of these people of the world in the six seals, he was also preserving for himself those who would not be harmed by any of it. Okay? So verse 4, And I heard the num... Oh wait, verse 3. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So these, these uh, people are going to get a seal on their forehead. We don't know what that seal is. We're not told. It could be some uh, eternal name of Jesus Christ that's imprinted there or whatever. But we do know this. It is a seal that will be recognized by all the angels who are in charge of the judgments on the earth. Because they can't touch the ones that are sealed. So that means that these angels, whether they be in the seal judgments or whether they be in the trumpet judgments or whether they be in the bowl judgments, what we know is that these angels are given not only the authority to implement the judgment on the earth, but to control the extent of that judgment. Because it will not affect those who have the seal on their head. Now we need to identify who those are that are getting that seal. So verse 4, and I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, 12,000 from each tribe.
Is this literal or figurative? Literal or symbolic? Is it literally 144,000 Jews and Jews only? Or is it symbolic? What do you think? Okay, you think it's literal, Janet. Speak up nice and loud for the recordings. Why do you think it's literal? Because I do. <laughs> <laughs> because I do, okay. Okay, who else says it's literal? Ryan, why do you think? It's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's not, I guess the way I look at it, it's not one of those spots where you're trying to figure out, okay, is it this or is it this? It lists 12,000 from this track, this track, this track, on down the list. Okay. Does anybody think it's figurative or symbolic? Okay. Why? I just think it's a kind of general overview that you can't count them. So you think the number is symbolic of a number that is countless? Right. Okay. Uh, that's a possibility. What about uh, is it symbolic of all people or are they for certain all Jews? Is it literally, are they literally all Jews or is it symbolic that it just represents all the different people of mankind? All of God's followers. You think all of God's followers? No. no. You think Jews. just Jews? Is there equal status between them right now? Equal status between Jew and Gentile, you think? No. Okay, let's, let's evaluate it. Bruce? I just have a question and without looking back and having an explanation. What happened to the tribe of Dan? Okay, we're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's look at the arguments that have been presented. Let's look at Brandon's argument first. That, uh, that it's symbolic numerically of, of an infinite number. One of the authors, uh, one of the theologians that I have in my office uh, writes this. He says... Uh, 144,000 is a multiple of 12 times 12, 144,000 times 144 times 1,000, which is a multiple of 10 times 10 times 10, meaning a perfect cube of 10, meaning the number of perfection. So that 144,000 represents the 12 tribes of Israel times the 12 apostles of the church times the perfection of humanity in Christ, 10 times 10 times 10, so that it represents all of saved mankind from all of history. That they're sealed. What would be wrong with that? Why do we need to be, why do the people who are already dead need to be sealed to protect them from what's gonna happen? Okay, that's one good point. What's another one? I think maybe I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this because at this point I'm, I'm struggling with the timeline. This is this is after the rapture. Uh -huh. This is after the rapture. There's no church to be a part of this 144,000. There's no Gentiles to be a part of it. And as you read the rest of the chapter, you discover that all the Gentiles who get saved during the tribulation don't get sealed because they get martyred and they're in the presence of God already. The only people left on earth, once they accept Christ, once they come to Christ, the only people left on earth to qualify to be protected are the ones who don't get martyred. And it says in verses 9 through 17, all of the Gentiles are being martyred. They're in the presence of God. Therefore, it can only be Jews that are being sealed. Well, and see, doesn't this kind of bring home the idea that right now the, the Jewish faith in general thinks the Messiah is still coming. Right. Um, and have ever, after having talked with several Jews on a couple of trips to Europe, they, they still are waiting for the Messiah to come. Mm -hmm. And then the act of the rapture, wouldn't that be a catalyst for some of them saying, the Messiah has come, now we need to really wake up and pay attention. Yeah. Let, let me share with you just a brief, uh, brief point from current modern event current events okay and uh i only saw this briefly i i must confess that i'm i'm going to step out on a little bit of a limb here because i didn't study it completely and i can't even give you the name there is a there is a jewish rabbi in uh israel or was a jewish rabbi in israel who prior to his death 
He was recognized in Israel as kind of a prophetic rabbi. And he had written and sealed in an envelope only to be opened upon his death some information that he saw from Scripture that he wanted revealed after he was dead. And he died a while ago. And uh, they have discovered this envelope that he had left and they opened it. And it said, um, it said, I can tell you the identity of the Messiah. And his name is Yeshua. But the Jews don't. This is a Jewish rabbi, remember, saying this. And his name is Yeshua. But he cannot be revealed to Israel until after the death of who just died in Israel? Sharon. Ariel Sharon. And that was stated in his letter that the Messiah is Yeshua, but he will not be revealed until after Sharon is dead. And now this is coming out, and so the Jews are all looking at this going, are we to be looking now for the Messiah named Yeshua? That's happening in Israel right now. Yes? But they have a large uh, number of uh, Messianic Jews in Israel. Oh, I know, but this wasn't one. This isn't one of the Messianic no, Jews. But I mean, that is already going. Oh, absolutely. But the, 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 the key principle here, the key point I'm trying to make is this, that this is a traditional Orthodox Jew rabbi respected by the Orthodox rejectors of Christ as being their chief rabbi and prophet of the last hundred years. And all of a sudden he is announcing to the rest of Orthodox Judaism that the Messiah is Yeshua and look for his revelation on earth after Ariel Sharon dies. But you know, when you study other books of the Bible, too, you know, they, there's always this theme going through, you know, that God always has this remnant yes. left, left in the Jewish nation, too. And I guess the, the question is, is that remnant the Messianic Jews, or is that remnant still the the you know the old orthodox jews that haven't turned to christ this is okay God's let's remnant from let's look at it brian well i guess my take on it would be that it would be the orthodox jews that i would consider the messianic jews to be part of the church right. amen right. they're going to be raptured that's what i assume too so see the, but I, I guess what i was always thought was that these 144,000 were part of god's remnant yes i agree and that they will, they will all of a sudden have their eyes opened after the rapture. Right. And that God will seal them, 12,000 from each tribe. I believe that this is only Jews. This is literally to be interpreted as plain language. Remember one of our first statements way back at the beginning of this study? If the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. <laughs> well, and... and won't this kind of correspond with the desire in the hearts of the Jewish people to return to their land? Because they were, they've been scattered all over the world. Yep. And it, I think there's some mention where they will have a, a, a deep-seated desire in their hearts to return to yeah. Judah, to return to Israel. Would right. that correspond with the sealing of these? Oh, I, I think definitely it will. Because not only are these sealed, but then we read later on in the 13th and 14th chapters about how they've been protected and how they have been taken away to a safe place and they're guarded and yeah i mean this 144,000 will be the jews who stand in jerusalem on the day jesus returns to set up his kingdom and they'll be the welcoming party waiting for the king they'll be preserved for the whole seven years without any conflict, well, not that they won't have conflict against them, but they will not suffer the consequences of the tribulation. And they will be the ones 
that will be the greeting party for Jesus when he comes back and says, I'm establishing my kingdom on earth to fulfill the messianic promises of the Old Testament. The Jewish nation is going to be restored again to its rightful place as the ruler of all the earth. And you, my 144,000, are my beginning point for the next thousand years. Go forth and multiply. This might be getting a little bit too much into some you know, nitpicky things, but will that 144,000 have the ability and the commandment by God to, to spread his word during the tribulation? You know, scholars differ on that, okay? There are, uh, Tim LaHaye, for example, says that yes, the 144,000 are the evangelists that are sent all over the world to win the Gentiles to Christ because they can't be hurt by the tribulation. Others, like Dr. Ironside and Dr. Walvard, say no, this 144,000 were not told that they ever do any evangelizing on the earth. Revelation doesn't reveal that. It just says they are only protected and held as the remnant. And so there's disagreement, okay, between some of the theologians. All right, so we've got a question on the table from Bruce about why isn't Dan included? What other... There, there's not only Dan, but there's another Ephraim? Ephraim isn't in there either. And who is in this list that's not in any of the other lists of the Old Testament of the tribes? Levi. Levi and Joseph. Now, Joseph is easy to explain. Why? What, what, what happened? How, now, let me ask you this. If we count all the tribes that have ever been listed as an official tribe of Israel, how many are there? There's 13. There's 13. Levi was removed from the original lists. Why? Because he's the priest. They were the priests and they were not allowed to own any land. So they had no rightful inheritance to the promised land. Because they had sacrificed that in order to be the servants of God. Oh, what a great spiritual lesson there is in that for all of us. What are we willing to sacrifice of earthly reward for the sake of serving the king? like the tribe of Levi. They gave up, gave up all rights to inheritance to any land. They could not own land. They simply served the king. And so they're not in the Old Testament lists of the inheritors of the promised land. So since they're out, now we have only 11. Except if, if we count Joseph, who is, you remember we're, we're talking about the sons of Jacob, 12 sons of Jacob, Take Levi out, now we have only 11. So what did God do? He split Joseph's tribe into two through Joseph's sons, Jacob's grandsons. And who were they? Ephraim and Manasseh. Which one's listed here in this list? Manasseh. So Joseph is just simply taking the place of Ephraim. But it still doesn't answer the question of where did Dan go? So where did Dan go? Levi gets put back in. Dan's not there. Why isn't Dan listed? The tribe of Dan was the first tribe to screw up and turn back to idolatry. And they forfeited their right to the land. So they're not listed here as one of the chosen ones that will be sealed. The tribe of Dan gave up their right because they turned away from God and turned back to idolatry. Now that's hypothetical, that's just using all of scripture to try to come to a conclusion that isn't directly stated. But that's kind of how we work through that list to discover why those tribes are listed the way they are. But the bottom line point is this, they are all tribes of Israel and they are, are, are all assigned a specific number of 12,000 from each tribe. Could that number be symbolic? Of, of a perfect number from each tribe, so the number may not be literally 144,000. And again, the plain sense makes perfect sense. Why wouldn't it be, strictly? Do, do, you think, do you think God knows in his mind the exact number of how many will be his bride? Yes. It tells us that, doesn't it? It tells us that in scripture. It says that we are to, we are to do our very best uh, is it 2 Peter? Yes, 2 Peter. We're to do our very best to continue to live faithful lives and to be public witnesses for Jesus Christ so that we hasten the day of his coming. How does our being a public witness hasten the day of the Lord's return? 
Because the more we are witnessing, the more we are winning people to Christ until the number of the bride is complete. And as soon as the number of the bride is complete, the bride, the groom comes to get his bride. Okay? So, um, so we know that God has a specific number. He's sovereign. He knows who the elect are. They're chosen before the foundations of the world. He knows exactly how many there are that have to be saved. Okay? He certainly can choose exactly 12,000 from each tribe of Israel to make up the 144,000. But there's been some pretty weird explanations for who these 144,000 are. Okay? For example, uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists believe that the 144,000 will be only those people. And this, this just... Stuff like this just drives me crazy because all the people who are already dead as Seventh-day Adventists are already out of the running. Because in order to be a member of the 144,000, you have to be in the middle of communion at the time of the rapture. You have to be found in church, in communion, at the time of the rapture, or you don't get to be a part of the 144,000. I don't know. I don't know. And that's why, that's why, folks, again, I'm, I'm trying to te teach a discerning spirit here, and I, I'm, I'm rather bold because this goes out on YouTube. Just because a church calls themselves Christian doesn't mean they're Christian. There are false doctrines in some of these churches, and we want to guard against being susceptible to them by having a discerning spirit. You know about Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that too. They will, they can qualify to be a part of the 144,000 by being the most faithful and productive servants while they're on this earth and that they will be rewarded by the God of this world. They will be rewarded with status because they worked the hardest to earn their salvation. They do not interpret this literally as being Jews only. And as soon as we slip out of interpreting this as being Jews only, and we begin to in any way open our mind to the possibility that Gentiles could be included in this number, then we become selfish and want to be one of them. And we will develop theologies that make us one of them. These are Jews and Jews only, preserved after the church has been raptured at the beginning of the tribulation and held safe for the 144,000. Let's see, I thought it was on here somewhere. Um, no, it's not. Sorry. I thought, uh, I thought there was a line that went across the bottom. It must be the other one. There's a line on one of these that shows the 144,000 being preserved through the whole tribulation until we see them later on before the throne of God in, I think, the 13th or 14th chapter. Okay, so, the, um, the debate between who they are, what their number is, uh, again, I agree with Ryan, it just makes perfect sense to interpret it literally, and it does to me also. Okay, starting in verse 9. After this vision of what was going on, I looked again, John says, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Another worship service <laughs> in heaven. Okay, another worship service. You remember a previous worship service back in the fourth chapter, right? 
and also in the fifth, but the fourth chapter specifically. And around the throne, chapter 4, verse 4, were 24, throne, uh, 24 thrones, and seated on the throne were 24 elders, and then the torches that were around them, and then the four living creatures, and then they all got together and they started singing and shouting, and there was a big worship service that went on. Okay? Now, this crowd of people that is seen before the throne, if we stopped reading right there, it would be possible for us to think, since they're wearing white robes, they have palm branches in their hands, they're crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. These are people who represent the church. That's what we would think. We could possibly think that, but we need to read on so that we can discover their true identity because if they were the church and it was that obvious that they were the church, John would not have to be asked the next question because he would identify himself with them and he would know who they are because he was part of the church. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? So one of the elders sitting around the throne of God says, Hey, John, you know who these guys are? And basically what he's saying is, John, in case you're wondering, you probably are. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to speculate on what your mind is thinking right now. And you're probably wondering who these are, so I'm just going to ask you, who do you think they are? And John says to him, Sir, you know. In other there's words, there's a, a good student answer. Yeah, there's a good student <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. No, no, don't, yes, no, no, just you know. Don't yeah. use this. Don't. <laughs> or, or like the like the little boy sitting in class when the teacher asked a question. What's four times four? Teacher, really? You don't know? <laughs> How did you get to be a teacher? <laughs> You ever had anybody try to pull that on you, Chris? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Okay. So anyway, sir, you know. And the elder said to him, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is not the church. This crowd is not the church. These are the martyrs that are being killed during the tribulation by either the seal judgments that are, have been released already on the earth. When the mountains fall to the, to the ground and every mountain and every island is displaced and you're a Christian living on the island, you don't get floaties. <laughs> you die with everybody else. Okay? And we know that uh, the six seals are having a horrible effect. How many of the people on the earth are dying during the first six judgments? What did we say, remember? Was it a third or a fourth? Okay. Where? So are, are these people different than the ones that were under the throne? Uh, yes. Yes. A fourth of the earth, chapter 6, verse 8. The pale rider on the horse uh, with death and Hades following him, given a power and authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, in wars, with famine and pestilence, wild beasts, and so on. Okay? Out of all of those that are killed, a huge multitude that cannot be counted are going to be Christians who are going to be standing before the throne. So we know they're not the ones that are under the throne. These are all now standing before the throne. This might seem like a technicality, but is, is, that, is that going to include both those who are killed by the judgments and those who are killed for their faith? Like, you know, the, the period of execution? I think, I, the mark of the beast, you're killed? I think that's the distinction. The ones that are killed for being a Christian, killed by the opposing warriors representing Satan, are under the throne, crying out, when are you going to take vengeance for us? 
But all of those who die as a natural result of what's going on during the tribulation, having accepted Christ, as a result of the six seals that are going out. Because see, officially, Satan has not been released yet to kill Christians massively, but we know there's going to be martyrs for their faith just as there are today. There's martyrs all over the world today for Christ that are dying for their stand. And in the beginning of the tribulation, that's not going to change. When one nation rises up against another nation and a Christian prophet stands up and says this is wrong and he's killed by both sides for his stand for Christ, I mean, the, the Muslim nations and the other nations of the world that, that are opposed to Christianity, that are killing Christians even today, that's going to continue after the rapture, and they're going to be martyrs, and they're going to be separated out from this throng that is standing before the throne of God now in white robes and crying out, salvation belongs to our God. Notice they're not crying out, take vengeance on us. They're simply focused on their salvation, and we learn a huge lesson here on how we're supposed to endure tribulation. How we should endure hardship in our lives. It should always be with the anticipation of standing before the throne of God someday and say, it didn't matter what happened to me, I'm saved. It doesn't matter what happens to me, I'm saved. And that's all they can shout out. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and then everybody joins in in worshiping. They are people who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Doesn't seem possible to make something white by washing it in blood, does it? I have a terrible time getting blood out of stuff. You know, so I turn it over to Denise and she can't get it out. Well, she can sometimes. She, she knows the little tricks, but she can generally do it. But, uh, you know, you only put a shirt on like this on a day that you didn't cut yourself shaving. <laughs> otherwise, it's the only day you ever get to wear that shirt. But the blood of the lamb cleanses us from all unrighteousness making us spotless. And this worship celebration is tremendous because with the, with the elders, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, the 24 elders representing the church and the, the four living creatures fall on their faces, the church does, and says, Amen. Welcome to glory to all of these who are dying as a result of the judgment of sin on the earth. Pastor, yes. I've always thought it must be difficult to become a Christian when I'm assuming the Holy Spirit is taken up with the believers. Mm -hmm. That's what I've always thought anyway. So it must be that there's all of this stuff that they've been, that people have left information when people refuse to listen. And when everything starts happening like it does, they've got to realize I goofed up. Yeah. Yeah. So even without the Holy Spirit, and it says that you couldn't even count the people that were standing. Right. Yeah, I want to clarify something, though, that it, it won't be without the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, let, me, let me make a distinction, okay? The Holy Spirit had an incredible ministry prior to the, to the day of Pentecost on the earth, didn't he? Sure. Did the Holy Spirit have a ministry on the earth prior to Pentecost? Yeah. No. Yeah. no. Yeah. Didn't, doesn't it tell us in the Old Testament that there were people that were spontaneously filled with the Holy Spirit so they could accomplish something for God and then the Holy Spirit was removed? Okay. But the Holy Spirit was still ministering. Didn't it tell us that, that who, who's the agent of creation? No, the agent. The Holy Spirit. God is the author of it. Jesus is the designer of it. And the Holy Spirit is the agent of the actual creative power. What does it say in Genesis 1-1? In the beginning was, no. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was void and without form. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. Holy Spirit has always been involved in human activity. Always been here. Always at work. But at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit changed his location to being in here, not out here. So that the influence of the Holy Spirit comes from us into other people. From in here. But just because the church is gone and the indwelling aspect of the Holy Spirit is gone, the ministry of the Holy Spirit doesn't stop. 
He's still ministering all over the world, bringing people to conviction because people were saved before Pentecost, right? Because we know that there were 120 people that were the ones to first get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, you can't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit unless you're saved. So we know those people were saved without the indwelling. You, you get my point. Yes. Okay? <laughs> All right, verse. Is it one of, wasn't before this one of his major things was, as we talked about before, the restrainer? And now I think when we talk about being raptured, that part of the Holy Spirit is no longer in effect. Right. But the Holy Spirit is always here. The Holy Spirit is always here. Yeah. And so in verses 15 through 17, we have a little poetic psalm that is shared to, with us by John. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, as great as that promise is, don't claim it for yourself, because it doesn't apply to the church. There's other promises that say <laughs> similar things that we still get to apply to us as the church, but this promise applies to the people who are being killed during the tribulation. Notice the references. They shall hunger no more. What's one of the seal judgments? Famine. 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 They shall thirst no more. See, yep. What's uh, the sun shall not strike them? Sir. What does it say? The sun became black as sackcloth. The moon, the full moon became like blood. The stars fell to the sky. The sky actually vanished like a scroll being rolled up. Sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Imagine the atmosphere of the earth being rolled up. What's, what's the ultraviolet radiation of the sun going to do to the earth when the, when the atmosphere is removed? We already know what happened after the days of Noah. Because prior to the days of Noah, the atmosphere was a water vapor canopy. It had never rained on the earth. The flood says, I, God says, I will release the waters from above and beneath. So the water canopy broke down. Prior to, the, prior to the flood, man lived average of 900 years on the earth. All of a sudden, the water canopy is gone. Now ultraviolet rays get through better. And what happens? Man's lifespan becomes 120 years. And it's decreased ever since, even though now it's a little bit more on the increase again. But, okay. So, so you, see, you see now, all of a sudden in the sixth seal, the sky gets rolled up like a scroll, and less of the and, and the atmosphere has less ability to resist the scorching effects of the sun, and we finally have global warming. <laughs> <sighs> okay, but notice, notice in verse 15, what is the role of these people that are coming out of the tribulation? Serving him in the temple day and night. Okay? Take the role of the Levites. They, they kind of do. Take the role of the Levites. But notice, that's not the role of the bride of Christ. So this isn't the church. Because the role of the bride of Christ is not to serve God the Father in the temple. Who will shelter them with his presence role of the bride of Christ is to serve the king on the earth during the millennium. So we now see a distinction between those who are the bride of Christ and what their role is going to be in eternity. The church, the bride, serving the king as the king on the earth. And those who are killed during the tribulation, not a part of the bride, but still get an equal role in eternity of serving God the Father around the throne. And one is not better than the other. It's just different. It's like pink and blue in a marriage. Okay? Not wrong. Just different. 
And so you see the distinctions. And so we have to read carefully and we have to say, okay, is that how the bride is described elsewhere? No, it's not. This is not the bride. These are those who are coming out of the great tribulation. And I say the great tribulation because in verse 14, it says, as the elder says to John, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. The Greek is very emphatic here. The Greek, uh, the Greek identifying uh, participle, the, is present in the original Greek language. If you looked at uh, if you looked at places like Peter, where it says, uh, where Peter says, uh, uh, in this greatly rejoice, even though now you go through periods of trial and tribulation. The Greek article is not there. He doesn't say, even though now for a while you must go through the tribulation. It's just tribulation in general. But here a distinction is made. They're going, these are the ones that have come out of the great tribulation, not just people who have come out of tribulation and hardship and trial. These are directly souls who are being saved during the great tribulation. And notice at the time that John sees them before the throne, how many of them are there? We don't know. We can't count them all. We can't count them all. Now, does that does that give you I'll get to, does does that give you any uh, confidence in the power of God to be victorious over the forces of evil? That in the worst time of man's tribulation and suffering and hardship because of his sin, God is saving the greatest number of people that have ever been saved. Countless numbers during the tribulation that will come to Christ. Almost makes you want to be here to watch it, doesn't it? <laughs> almost, almost. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If... If we have to speculate what kind of joy that would bring us by seeing that be many people coming to Christ, then what does that tell us? Why do we have to speculate about what kind of joy that would be when today we have the opportunity to experience it personally if we were being faithful witnesses and drawing people to Christ? We could be experiencing that. Sunday morning, um, Sunday morning I was introduced in church as I walked in uh, down to my seat and uh, uh, I walked past and I saw one of our Chinese church planters' wives, June, and I shook her hand and as I said hello to her and greeted her, I noticed behind her was a young Chinese girl sitting. And so I immediately turned to her and I Shucks put my hand out and June introduced me to Jeannie. Jeannie is a college student at the university. And last Friday night in their practicing conversational English Bible study on campus, she accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior. Amen. And I was introduced to her on Sunday. And in the first song that we sang after the announcements on Sunday, I don't know if you remember what it was. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I know the theme was basically this, that uh, uh, every, the congregation was singing, let us rejoice and be bold to tell people that we are followers of Jesus. That was the basic context of the song. And I left my seat and I walked back to Jeannie and I said, Jeannie, would you be willing to come up front with me right now and boldly tell people that you're a follower of Jesus? And she said, oh, no, that would make me too nervous. And I said, I respect that. Thank you. And I went back to my seat. And I know the day is coming when she will do that. But do you see, I was so just overflowing with joy that here in the midst of our congregation on Sunday morning already, there was a brand new follower of Jesus. Do you understand the eternal magnitude of that? And do you appreciate the fact that you have the opportunity to be a part of what's going on and to experience the joy of that on a consistent basis if we are a part of the mission of Jesus Christ until the rapture to bring as many people as we can to the knowledge of the Savior? That is our whole mission. We have not been called and left here to do anything else but that. 
It is not your mission to make sure that you're saving marriages. It is not your mission to make sure that you're making money so that you can give to missionaries. It is not your mission. Now, that may, those may be elements of your mission, but that's not your mission. Our mission is one thing. Go and make disciples. That's it. That's it. And if we have to speculate about what kind of joy it would be like to experience on the earth the greatest revival of all times, then we have an issue as to why we're not involved in doing it right now. Okay? So that's the challenge I get from this, that in this huge number of people that are going to be saved, yeah, as much joy as it would be to watch that happen, even though I'll get to see the product of it in the presence of God someday, to be here to watch that happen, just think, we can watch that happen right now at Calvary. We had 371 people in church on Sunday. 371 people in here. We were, we were 20 people from being 80% full with the number of chairs we have. And what do they say happens at 80% full? People stop coming because they think you're full. We're setting up extra chairs starting this week. In case you get into your aisle this Sunday and you notice that the chairs are a little closer together, don't complain. <laughs> okay? Don't complain. Because little by little, we're going to start squeezing the rows down and adding more chairs at the back. Because we have to. Otherwise, we have to go to two services. Already in our church, we're growing <clears throat> that much. Do you understand the joy of that? Do you understand the incredible blessing that God has given us? And do you understand that this coming Sunday, we will not have enough room if every one of you brought one person? If everybody that was here last Sunday would bring one more person that they're intentionally on mission to bring to Jesus, if everybody did their mission this week, we would not have enough room in that church. Because 371 times 2 is what? 742. We only have 700 chairs. We can only seat 700 in there. We'd have 42 people out here in overflow already watching it on this TV screen. If everybody that's here was on mission and brought one person to church with them, do you realize that we're in the midst of a potential revival right here where countless numbers of people could come to Christ if we would decide this is what God has called us to do? So his promise is that the lamb will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and wipe away every tear from their eyes. The tears that they experienced in suffering for Christ while they were on this earth in the tribulation. God's going to wipe every one of those tears away and there'll be no more crying and no more pain for them and no more scorching of the sun. And they will be sheltered by the one who sits on the throne. Sheltered by the one who sits on the throne. What have you chosen as the shelter of your life? Your 401k? Your house? Your family? Your posterity? Or your prosperity? Your future? Your hopes, your dreams, your goals? What have you chosen as the shelter of your life? The only way to have your tears removed is to seek your shelter under the wings of the Almighty. He is the only one who can provide you peace and security. So um, check your priorities. Check your passions. Check your purpose. Get on mission for Jesus. Okay? Next week, chapter 8. God bless you. Pastor, before you leave, um, Let me shut these off a second. Okay.